Well, thank you for uh, inviting me back. Uh, I was here, I can't remember when, six months ago maybe, I'm not sure. But uh, I talked about the bank robbery back then. Uh, and uh, uh, if you missed it, uh, we did a reenactment of the bank robbery uh, this summer to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the bank robbery uh, in Kevin Shannon. Uh, we had about uh, four to 500 people turned out for the reenactment, so it was really a lot of fun. Uh, and my understanding is they're going to try and do it again next summer. So uh, if you missed it the first time, you might want to uh, come out and uh, see it the second time. <coughs> so tonight, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my other love, and that is the tall ship U.S. Brig Niagara. I'm a crew member on board. Uh, I've been a crew member now for uh, this going into my ninth uh, year uh, on board. And the, the ship uh, is uh, a very historic uh, ship because it participated uh, in the Battle of Lake Erie uh, in 1813. It's September 10th, 1813, uh, during the War of 1812, the uh, British launched a fleet uh, near Detroit and our fleet was ready for them. We had nine ships, they had six. Uh, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry was in command and defeated the uh, British uh, and of course sent out the famous message to William Henry Harrison who was in command of this theater of operation. Uh, the very famous message, we have met the enemy and they are ours. Uh, two ships, two brigs, a sloop and a schooner. And that battle changed the tide of the war because it gave us control of four of the five Great Lakes. It did not give us control of Lake Ontario because that's a totally separate lake that you can't get to from the other four lakes unless you go over Niagara Falls. So uh, our fleet controlled the upper four Great Lakes. The uh, original Niagara was built in 1813. The ship that we sail today is a reproduction built in 1988 by the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and the ship is owned by the state of Pennsylvania. The uh, ship is almost an exact replica of the original ship, and I'll explain in a moment here how that uh, came about. But this ship sails the five Great Lakes uh, as far up the uh, uh, St. Lawrence Seaway as uh, Quebec City, uh, although we have sailed out in the ocean, but uh, most of the time we do not leave the Great Lakes region. The uh, original ship, uh, after the War of 1812, uh, they tried to sell it. Nobody wanted it because, and I'll show you this in a moment also, because uh, it couldn't be used as a cargo ship because the hold was too shallow. Uh, the ship was built with a very, very uh, shallow uh, uh, draft, and therefore below deck is only five feet in height, and that does not carry much cargo, so nobody wanted it. So at the end of the war, they purposely sunk the ship in Misery Bay at Presque Isle, and with the thought that should it ever be needed in the near future, they could uh, raise it again and uh, put it back in shape uh, very, very quickly. Um, that sounds counterintuitive, but actually by sinking it, it does preserve the ship better than leaving it sitting at dock side. Well, in uh, 1876, uh, about 50 some years after the uh, Niagara and her sister ship, the Lawrence, were sunk, uh, was the American Centennial. Uh, and they decided that wouldn't it be neat to raise up the, the uh, uh, Lawrence and bring the Lawrence to uh, Philadelphia for the centennial. So they did. They raised the uh, Lawrence. They disassembled it, put it on a flatbed uh, and uh, flatbed uh, railroad car, hauled it down to Philadelphia uh, for the uh, centennial celebration. And while it was sitting in a warehouse getting ready to be put back together, the warehouse burned down and that was the end of the Lawrence. Well, a few years later in 1913, on the 100th anniversary of the battle, 
they again got the idea, let's raise the Niagara, rebuild it, and uh, take it around the five Great Lakes. So in 1913, they raised the Niagara. There it is. Now you and I look at that and you say, well, what's the point? What's left of it? Why? What are you going to do with it? It's, it's a, it's a, it, there's nothing left. Well, to somebody who knows what they're looking at, they said, oh, no problem. We can build a new ship right on top of that. And they did. In 90 days, they had a brand new ship that they then began hauling around the Great Lakes. And it was, uh, it went to all five Great Lakes uh, and uh, uh, was not able to sail. Uh, it was, so it was towed by the uh, ship you see on the uh, left here. That's the uh, uh, USS um, uh, Michigan, the first steel hauled uh, U.S. naval vessel on the Great Lakes. And she hauled it around uh, the Great Lakes uh, that entire summer of 1913. Now, it looks like they really did a great job rebuilding the ship. In fact, it looks like you just jump on board and sail it. Well, you can't. What you're looking at is what we, uh, uh, modern sailors, look at this. We would call it a Hollywood rig. It looks like it could sail, but that's it. It's just, it's, it's basically a big model, all right? It's not really a ship that can be sailed. Well, they, they towed this ship around all summer long. At the end of the summer, they brought it back to Erie, Pennsylvania, where it started, tied it up to the dock, stood there and looked at each other and said, <coughs> What the heck are we going to do with this thing? Nobody had given any thought as to what they would do with it once the summer was over. And so it was tied up to the dock where it sat for the next 50 or 60 years, rotting away at uh, the dock near State Street in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. It sunk three times, had to be pumped out and raised. It was an absolute mess. So in the 1930s, they tried to rebuild it. Uh, the WPA was given money to come in and start working on it. But by the time they got started, World War II broke out. And of course, funding for rebuilding a 130-year-old ship uh, just you know, wasn't in the cards. And so it was left alone. After World War II, again, it was sinking. Someone got the brilliant idea of let's haul it out of the water and set it up on concrete cradles. And so you can see these concrete cradles here. At the end of State Street, they brought the ship out, set it on these cradles, and they said, great, now we'll save the ship. Wrong. That made it rot faster. Being out of the water makes it rot even faster than being in the water. Well, by the 1960s, it was really falling apart even more rapidly. So they tried to rebuild it again in the 1960s. That didn't go very far. By the 1970s, into the late 1970s, they stopped letting people go on board because they were afraid that they would walk across the deck and fall through the deck and out through the bottom of the hall. It was that bad condition. So in the 1980s, the state of Pennsylvania finally said, what the heck are we going to do with this? So they hired a man whose name was Melbourne Smith. Smith was uh, one of the world-renowned historic naval architects. Uh, and he came to look at the ship and they said, give us a report how we fix this thing up and what we can do with it and so on and so forth. So when he finished his report, he came back and he said to the state, here's my report. Take it to a landfill and be done with it. There's nothing left here that you can make a ship out of. Well, the state said, no, we don't want that. We want the Niagara. The Niagara is a huge part of our state history. And Melbourne Smith said, well, I can build you a brand new Niagara. And so in 1988, Smith put together the plans, 
based on the original ship which we had, basically the original ship, and he was able to uh, uh, rebuild uh, the Niagara in 1988, and it was launched on the 175th anniversary of the battle. And so here you see the ship uh, first as it's being built, and then as it's being uh, launched uh, uh, in the water. We all love state bureaucracies, right? Okay, bureaucrats, they're great people. Let me tell you a little side story here. When they were building the ship, of course, the state assigned one of their experts to oversee it. Well, this person, from what we know, had never even walked on a tall ship, let alone uh, known how to build one. So he came in, and as they were putting the ribs together here, these are, these are the ribs, or what we call, they're actually called frames. As they were putting them together, uh, built in a modern way out of laminated uh, Douglas fir. Uh, it makes them very strong. And uh, as they were doing this, the, the man said, oh, whoa, wait, 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 this, this, this is all historically wrong. And Mel, Melbourne Smith said, what are you talking about? He said, the original frames we know were in two separate pieces. And he said, well, you know, this is modern times. We can build a stronger ship. The frames are totally hidden inside the ship. You don't see the frames. He said, it's better. And they said, no, no, no. This has got to be historically accurate. Cut all the frames in half and then rejoin them. And that's what they did. Now imagine that. Okay. You can imagine what uh, Smith was thinking uh, dealing with this uh, idiot from the state. Anyway, finally the ship gets built, and this is what we have today. The ship is a brig. A brig is a square rigged or uh, uh, ship rigged uh, vessel. Square rigged means not that the sails are square. In fact, if you look at them, they're trapezoids. A square rigged vessel is one where the yards cross the mast at a right angle. That's what makes it square rigged, okay? And a, a, a brig is a square rigged, two-masted uh, vessel. Now, uh, we carry uh, about 12,000 square feet of sail. Eight of our sails are square rigged, and uh, seven of them are what we call four and a half sails. That's the, the uh, the, the uh, staysail and the, and the jibs that you see here. And then in between, there are uh, three uh, uh, four and a half sails. And then on the stern is what's called the spanker, which is the biggest sail on the ship. So we carry a total of 15 sails on board the ship. By the way, let me clarify something that uh, all you land lovers tend to uh, get wrong. That piece of wood, okay, that holds up the sail is not a yard arm. It's a yard, okay? The yard arm is that little piece of the yard that sticks out beyond the sail, okay? That last little piece, that's the yard arm, okay? The yard is the entire spar that goes across. Okay, our masts are 118 feet and 113 feet, four Four mast is 113, and the main mast is 118. If you're not sure how tall that is, that's a person right there. Okay, so uh, uh, it, it's pretty interesting when you get up there during uh, bad weather, or when the ship is bouncing about, or in the middle of the night when it's totally black out, and you're climbing up there and there's no moon, it's just the stars. It can get a little hairy. On board ship, we have eight miles of line, okay? Eight miles. Now, there's two different kinds of line on a ship. One is what's called standing rigging. Standing rigging never moves. It's there to hold the mast in place. So you've got your mast, and the mast just can't stand there. It has to be supported. So we have shrouds that go to the bulwark, and then we have stays that run fore and aft. Those lines are what hold the mast in place. And they are 
put on and then they are tightened to, to, a, to a great uh, uh, tension to hold that mass in place. Then we have running rigging. The running rigging is what controls the sails. And the running rigging uh, comes down the deck onto what's called a pin rail. And you can see the pins here. And each one of those lines comes down the deck. There are 190 of those lines to control the 15 sails. Those 190 lines, every single one of them has a name and a job and you have to know what they are. Otherwise, you can't sail the ship. You have to know where they are and what they do. So when they call for a certain sail to be either braced around or to set it or take it in or to reef it up or whatever, you've got to know what line to go to and uh, what to do with that line. So it's, it's really, really a, a, a complicated job. Uh, in fact, in the 1800s, the most complicated piece of machinery on the face of the earth was a sailing vessel. They were uh, incredibly uh, technical uh, uh, machinery, uh, type of machinery. But when we're sailing, though, you can see uh, sometimes the deck begins to look like spaghetti uh, with the lines all over it, and uh, uh, it becomes <laughs> somewhat uh, uh, chaotic sometimes, uh, especially if the weather changes on us, trying to get things uh, uh, where they should be. So, uh, eight miles of, uh, of line uh, on the ship, and each year we change out probably uh, a third of it and uh, put up new line, uh, new lines for the sails or for the standing rig. The ship is 123 feet overall, meaning from, uh, from uh, the uh, stem to the stern, okay? So from uh, what are called the perpendiculars, from here to here is 123 feet. But the length of the ship, uh, the sparred length is 198 feet because when you get to the end of our head rig here, and all the way to the end of the spanker boom here, that adds an, an awful lot of uh, length to the ship. And you say, well, actually it doesn't. Well, yeah, it does. Because when we're in a slip and we have to turn the ship, we've got to account for the length of those booms uh, sticking out. So it does uh, make the ship significantly longer. But we have a very shallow draft, about 10 to 11 feet, depending on how much we have on board and so on. So we've got only about 10 or 11 feet draft, which makes the ship below deck very, very short. And the, uh, there was a reason for that, which I'll come back to in a few minutes. But below deck uh, is only five feet. So people like myself, I'm five foot nine. I'm always whacking my head below deck because as you're moving along, you're trying to stand up between the beams. And there's a little more space, but you turn around and then you walk right into a beam, you know. Uh, I always wear a hat below deck, otherwise my bald head is up all covered with scabs. So. Okay, uh, back in 1813, the ship carried 20 guns. If you take that gun and you put it on land, it's called a cannon. But when you put it on a ship, it's a gun, okay? It's just semantics. The two of the, the guns were 12 pounders, meaning that they fired a 12-pound cannonball. They were the long guns. They could fire a, a cannonball about a mile to a mile and a half and hit their target and do damage. But the real power on the ship were the 18 carronades. These short guns fired a 32-pound cannonball. 32 pounds. They were known in, uh, in all the navies as smashers because when that 32-pound cannonball hit the side of your ship, it went through it like a hot knife through butter. You could fire a 32-pound cannonball through 12 inches of solid oak, come through that uh, bulwark, knock down the mast, and go right through the other bulwark on the other side of the ship. 
That's how powerful they were. But the problem was they were short range. You had to get in close. So it's sort of the difference between uh, a, a, a tall prize fighter who has long arms and a short, stocky prize fighter with short arms that has to throw you know, short uh, jabs and uh, uppercuts. This kind of cannon, though, was uh, extremely effective on a small ship like the Niagara because it works differently. This ship, this cannon rather, is on what's called a naval carriage. It has four wheels. So when that gun was fired, it would roll backwards on those wheels. The other reason for the wheels was we only carried two of those. When we needed them up in the stern, I'm sorry, the bow, we could run them forward and put them out through the bow. Then they became what were known as bow chasers. If we were being chased, we could uh, uh, turn them around, run them to the stern, and put them out the stern and shoot at the ship that's chasing us. Then they became stern chasers. The carronades were different. They are pinned to the deck. This piece right here is pinned to the deck. And uh, the piece that the uh, carronade sits on is actually a slide. So when this gun is fired, the gun literally slides back on the lower piece. That's all the movement that that gun has, which is really good on a small ship like the Niagara, because if you have guns on both sides of the deck and you, they're both firing and they're rolling back towards each other, that's a problem. So a carronade has a limited throw, it comes back just a limited distance, and therefore uh, is not a, as much of a danger to the crew uh, as the ship uh, is being fun. So today we only carry two carronades. They weigh 3,000 pounds each. So we don't carry all 18. We've got all 18. And they are real. They are, these are not make-believe. They've all been test-fired uh, down at Indian Town Gap at their firing range. They're all real cannons. Okay? They literally could be used if, if need be to uh, fight. But, of course, uh, uh, that's not going to happen. But we do carry them, and we do fire them blanks. We're not allowed to fire cannonballs. That would violate international treaties with Canada. But, uh, you know, we do fire uh, blanks every time we sail. Today, the modern equipment on board the ship uh, is everything that you would expect because the Coast Guard requires it and because safety for our crew requires it. We carry things such as radar, GPS, depth finder, radios, locators, beacons. We have two 180 horsepower engines. And you say, whoa, wait a minute. That's not very authentic. That's the truth. But you see, we are paid all summer long to sail to other ports to show the ship at festivals and so on. We have to get there. We're a sailing ship. If the wind doesn't blow, we don't make our schedule. Okay? So we have to be able to get to where we're going. So if need be, we fire up the engines. It's also a safety thing. If you know anything about the Great Lakes, when storms come up in the Great Lakes, they come up extremely fast. And you have to sometimes be able to fire up the engines to get into port ahead of a storm uh, for safety reasons. Uh, we carry four self-inflating uh, life rafts. Uh, we have personal flotation devices for every person on board. Uh, we uh, have exposure suits, which are, uh, what you see here, this is an exposure suit, and that's my wife, isn't she cute? Uh, <laughs> She's also a sailor. Uh, she sails with us. And uh, uh, those are so if the ship were to sink and the water is cold, we put those on and uh, they're supposed to protect you in uh, 35 degree water for 48 hours. Who knows? I don't know if that is true or not. But uh, we carry full firefighting equipment and three boats. Notice I don't say lifeboats, three boats. 
These are, these are historic type boats that would have been on board the ship in 1813. They're cutters and yachts. Uh, but I can guarantee you in a pinch, they would become lifeboats. All right, it's not like we would uh, abandon those uh, if there was a problem. Back in 1813, the only propulsion was the wind, or we could break out the sweeps and row, row, row the boat if we need to. And we do this every summer. We break out the uh, sweeps to show people what it looks like if you have to row the ship, which, believe me, is a huge undertaking. Those sweeps weigh 200 pounds each. They take two to three people uh, to operate each one. And as <laughs> when we do this, uh, how many of you remember the original uh, um, Charlton Heston Ben Hur movie? Remember that? Okay. Remember when they were on the on the slave galley? And they had a guy up there with a drum and boom, boom, making. Well, we do that too because that's the only way to get everybody in the same rhythm, all rowing in the same at the same uh, speed. Back in 1813, they had none of these safety devices that we had. They did not have flotation devices and life rafts uh, and that sort of thing. Navigation was strictly by compass, a sextant, and the stars. And that was it. Now, navigating on the Great Lakes was a whole lot easier than navigating out in the ocean because almost anywhere you sail on the Great Lakes, uh, you're inside of shore, unless you're up on Lake Superior, which is huge, and then you're not necessarily inside of the shore. But you can always sail close to the shore and uh, not lose your way. But once you're out in the ocean, uh, that's it. That's all they had in those days. The idea of, of safety, like we know today, just literally just didn't exist. Uh, that wouldn't come in for uh, another 50 to 75 years after this ship uh, where safety started to become a concern. Below deck, as I said, is very short, five foot ceiling. Uh, when you come on board, you are assigned a sea bag. And in that sea bag is uh, all that you're allowed to have. When I sailed uh, last summer for 24 days uh, from uh, uh, Duluth, Minnesota, back to Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, what I could put in my sea bag is it. So, uh, you know, the, what fits in there uh, is, is all that you can bring on board because there's not much space on board. And in fact, this same space that you see me standing here is also where we sleep. We sleep in hammocks, just like they did in 1813, okay? And we sleep on what's called the birth deck. Uh, and the birth deck is an area that you could probably fit uh, in here. And there's 24 hammocks stretched in that area. And uh, believe me, at night, it's a cacophony of sounds and odd smells uh, with everybody uh, below deck. Um, but I love sleeping in my hammock. I, I sleep as well in my hammock. In fact, I sleep better in my hammock than I do in my outrageously expensive uh, sleep number of bed. Uh, it, it's, a, it's really very comfortable. Uh, just want you to note, uh, you see these, these rails right here. In the next picture, you'll see this is where we attach our tables when we are uh, eating below deck. Those are the same rails right there. In fact, my hammock is directly above uh, this table. The tables are only put up when we eat, and then they're immediately taken back down. Uh, if you are a, one of the professional crew on board, you might get a bunk, or if you're one of the mates or the captain, you get a cabin. Ooh, a cabin. The cabin is about the size of one and a half of these tables, okay? That's the cabin, all right? <laughs> I have almost as much space in my hammock as the people who have cabins have. So it's not like these are uh, comfy, cozy uh, conditions. On board, all of our food is cooked on a wood-burning stove, just as it was in 1813. 
In fact, the stove itself is from 1820. So um, our cooks, uh, uh, which I, I've been, as I said, this is my ninth year sailing. I have never yet been on board that we've had a bad cook. Our cooks are phenomenal. And I can tell you, uh, you ladies who like to cook, think about what it takes to make a meal for 40 people on a wood-burning stove three times a day, okay? It's a big job, and uh, our cooks are terrific people. Uh, and we've had both male and female cooks uh, on board, so. There are no luxuries on board. Uh, our shower consists of putting our fire hose pump overboard and pumping uh, lake water on the deck, and that's, that's how we take our shower. Uh, when we were on Lake Superior uh, last summer, uh, the uh, water temperature was 55 degrees. And let me tell you, it was a fast shower. Uh, we do have three heads on board, and uh, I'm standing outside the door to take the picture of this head, because that's all the bigger it is. Uh, think of like a big phone booth, okay? That's, that's the head. There is no hot uh, running water on deck or on board. Uh, there's hot water for the, for the galley, but there's no hot water for the crew. So it's all cold water. Back in 1813, there were 155 people on board this tiny little ship. 155. And you look at that and you say, how is that possible? What, why did they need so many people? Well, there were 20 guns on board. Every gun had a crew of six men. Six times 20, 120. So 120 of the 155 were the, were the people on board operating the guns. The rest, the other 35, sailed the ship during the battle. See, you have to remember, this is a sailing vessel. So during a battle, you have to have a crew that's sailing the ship, that's operating the sails, okay? And they are not the same ones that are firing the cannons. They can't. You can't do both, okay? Well, today we sail with about 35 to 40 people. We carry a crew of 15 to 18 professionals, and the professionals range in age from 18 to about 35. And then there are uh, either trainees which is what I was telling the uh, uh, high school kids here about, that you come on board as a trainee, or people like myself that are volunteers that are on board uh, when there's uh, a need for additional crew. And just to show you that even old people like me can do this, that's me right there. Uh, <laughs> The crew today, compared to back then, is co-ed. And it's about 50-50. In fact, two summers ago, the captain and then the chief mate uh, were men, and then the second, third, and fourth mates were all ladies, okay? Uh, my AB, uh, able-bodied uh, seafarer, is uh, a, a young lady uh, from uh, Connecticut. She uh, stands about that tall and uh, does anything and everything that's needed on board. Uh, male, female does not matter on this ship. <laughs> the first time my wife ever went up to the ship, we were up, up there doing some work on it, and they put my wife to work carrying these huge wooden beams with some other guy, and, and she's struggling. And she came over and she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm vacuuming. <laughs> <laughs> I was below deck vacuuming the deck, so uh, that doesn't matter. And, and the age and uh, 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 makeup of the crew is everything. We've got you know old people like Pat over here who's the uh, same age as me. Uh, he's a uh, retired professor from the uh, University of Maryland. Uh, that was our cook, Lori, that year. Uh, the younger guys, uh, this uh, girl was from uh, Montreal, her name uh, Charlotte, uh, 
she was about 22 at that point when I took that picture. The, the crew is a, is a great mixture. When we sail with college kids or high school kids on board, same thing. It's, it's, a, it's a complete mixture of, uh, of uh, male and female and uh, all sizes and shapes. The work is, uh, can be hard and diverse. Sometimes it's challenging. Uh, not everybody likes to climb. No one is required to climb. Uh, there are a few people that simply don't climb. It's not a big deal. You don't climb, you don't climb. <laughs> Nobody says a word. Nobody, you want to see the least judgmental group of people in the world come on board. If somebody says to you, hey, uh, can you go aloft? And you say, no, I, I can't do that today. They'll say, okay, fine. Can you go aloft? And that's it. Nobody, nobody blinks an eye. It's, it's just the way it is. Uh, it's all hands-on work. There are no mechanical devices on board, no powered mechanical devices on board the ship. My favorite quote, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. Here you see my wife steering the ship. The ship uh, does not have a wheel. We have what's called a tiller. And there's a reason for that. They believe that the ship was built with a tiller uh, because the ship was needed for battle yesterday. When they were building the ship, they were building it as fast as they, as they could possibly build it in 1813. And to build, build a wheel is a much more complicated mechanism. So having a tiller made it a lot simpler. Plus, there's a huge advantage to a tiller in a battle. If you shoot away the tiller, you can run over here and pick up oh, a, a capstan bar or something. You pull the pin out, you stick it in there, and you're back steering. You shoot away the wheel of a ship, they're done. There's no steering the ship. Okay, So they think that's why they did it. It takes two people to steer the ship. Uh, you can only see my wife or someone standing on the other side. And they use these relieving tables on both sides to uh, uh, control the, uh, the uh, ship as we're steering. All the heavy lifting on deck on board the ship is done with a capstan. And a capstan is basically an upright winch, if you will. Uh, you put the bars in it and then uh, you wrap around the uh, base of the barrel, whatever it is that you're lifting, uh, whether it's the anchor or maybe we're hauling a new uh, uh, yard up or maybe uh, uh, lifting a, can, a, a gun on board or whatever, uh, this, this is how we do all of our heavy lifting. Okay, And it, believe me, it's hard. When we go to lift the anchor, when the anchor's been dropped out in the middle of Lake Erie and it's got itself embedded in the bottom. Uh, last year when we were at Puddin Bay, it took us an hour and a half to get the anchor off the bottom. It was so embedded. And believe me, when you're lifting a 1,900 pound anchor, okay, it's like lifting a car uh, off the bottom of the lake, uh, it is very difficult. Here you can see, this is the anchor uh, road right here. Road is just another word for rope, okay, or cable. This is the anchor rope. Uh, it's six inches in diameter, okay, to carry that, which sounds really big until you get on board a ship like the HMS Victory over in England. Their anchor was so huge that their anchor road was 21 inches in diameter. Can you imagine that? This was before the age of chain. Uh, once chains came in, all, all this stuff went away. There's two kinds of climbing on board. One is climbing up. Uh, here you see me sitting up above on what's called the fighting top or climbing out. You go out on the head rig, out on that uh, uh, pointy piece uh, that goes out in front of the ship. And uh, uh, because there's sails out there that have to be uh, tended to. So you're either climbing up or out. I love climbing out on the head rig. It's a spectacular view of the ship. But when we're sailing, and we're coming into port, uh, everybody can't wait to go aloft because you get the greatest view uh, from uh, uh, way up aloft like that. On board, uh, uh, everyone carries two tools, and the tools they carry are your knife and your marlin spike. Um, yeah, 
we'll leave the lights off for now. Uh, you can come up and take a look at this uh, when we're done. A marlin spike is uh, what looks like a giant nail. Get it up here in the lights so you can see a little bit better. Uh, uh, it looks like sort of a giant nail, and its purpose is uh, many fold. Uh, we use it for doing things such as uh, if you have a, a knot that you're having trouble to untie, you, you work this in and you can work the knot apart with your marlin spike. Or you might use it, do me a favor, grab the end of that. Okay. You might use it uh, if you have to tighten something. And you can't sometimes just pull on something to tighten it. So you make uh, what's called a marlin spike hitch and then you've got good leverage and you can pull on something to tighten it. Uh, and and uh, make it uh, more secure. We also all carry knives on board. Uh, our knives, as you can see, are rounded. We literally break off the tip of our knives and round them. That's so that when you're up aloft and you drop your knife, it doesn't stick in the head of the person below you. Okay? Which is not a nice thing. All right? So you have to be careful with that. But everything we, we carry aloft is lanyard onto you so you can't uh, lose it and drop it down to deck. If you drop something down to deck, I guarantee you, you will hear about it. Nothing uh, goes aloft. Even your hat has to be tied on. Yeah, my glasses are tied on. Every, everything that we go aloft uh, has to be secured. Okay, so in the wintertime, after October, the ship is literally taken apart. And I mean right down to the hull. The hull stays in the water, but we take everything apart on the ship. The mast sometimes come out. We've got the main mast out right now. Uh, and uh, uh, everything comes off the ship, goes inside to our, our, rig, uh, um, our rig shop and we redo everything. Everything is scraped and painted and polyurethane and uh, uh, tarred and whatever needs done is done all winter long. Starting in January, we have a thing called sail training. And at sail training, every other Saturday, you come up, it's for free. And one Saturday, uh, they might be working on uh, knots, splicing, and seizing. Uh, we learn lots of different kinds of knots, okay? We learn all these kinds of things because they're used on board the ship. A splice is something like this, where you take the rope and make something like that. Right? It's called an eye, eye splice. Uh, a seizing, again, you can't see it in the dark, but if you want to come up and look at this afterwards. A seizing is where two lines are joined together and clamped together using uh, uh, string called marlin. Uh, we teach line handling. In our museum, above our rig shop, is the actual uh, upper part of uh, uh, one of our masts. We have the, uh, what's called the royal and the tagallant sails inside. So in the wintertime, we can teach people how to raise sails, how to furl sails, and how to actually climb safely uh, up and down the mast. We can do that inside in the wintertime. And that's part of the training uh, that takes place. Uh, you'll learn things like helm commands, how to steer the ship. Everybody steers the ship. Okay, it's not just you know one person who's the helmsman. Everybody steers the ship. Everyone takes a turn uh, at the helm. Uh, you'll learn safety drills. We learn uh, fire, fire drills, how to fight a fire on board the ship. We learn man overboard, how to deal with someone going overboard. See my wife's up there in the shroud. She's acting as what's called a spotter, and her job is to climb the shroud immediately upon hearing someone's gone overboard, find that person, and point to where that person is. Uh, we do the uh, abandoned ship drill, where we uh, uh, literally uh, uh, put on our uh, uh, immersion suits, and uh, also uh, we have what's called a flooding drill in case we were to get uh, damaged and have to start to take on water. So we learn all these kinds of things during the sail training in the wintertime. 
The only thing we uh, do is we learn the history of the ship so that you know the ship. Because every port we go to, our job is to tell people the history of the ship. That's the whole purpose of it. We are the state of Pennsylvania's ambassadors, if you will, everywhere we go. And as I said, we do all five uh, on the Great Lakes. Uh, that winter maintenance uh, is involved. Uh, like I said, uh, it, 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 you can see my wife up here. Uh, she's working on a stay, making a brand new stay, which is a, uh, what holds up the mast. Uh, here on the other side, you see them actually building a new mast. Uh, our mast was damaged and needed to be replaced. Uh, again, my wife painting uh, the cross trees. And here we are working on some netting that goes up on the head rate. So all winter long, we've got all sorts of work that we do. Uh, and uh, uh, that, uh, it, it goes literally from mid-October until May 1st. May 1st, we're back in the water and we're sailing. In fact, this summer, uh, if, if there's interest for you, you can come and sail with us. These are the dates that we're going to be uh, doing day sails. There's four, uh, we do four hour sails, take you out in, into Lake Erie and sail for four hours. You actually can help sail the ship. Right? We'll even let you steer the ship. The only thing we don't let you do is climb, but you can do virtually everything else. You can stand, uh, look out with us, or you can uh, uh, get up on the bridge with the captain and so on. But you get to see how the ship sailed uh, back in 1813. You can be a part of it. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, the uh, flagship org, and you click on the emblem that says book a day sale, uh, you can book a day sale. Uh, it's $85 for non-members. If you're a member, it's uh, $65. And it only costs $25 to join. So if you're buying more than one ticket, it's worth joining the Niagara League to save the money. Niagara, we hope, will continue to sail into the future. State funding is always an issue. That's pretty obvious in this day and age. It's not cheap to run the ship. The state gives us $300,000 a year. We raise $1.2 ourselves every year to keep the ship sailing. So it's a huge undertaking, to say the least. But uh, we truly believe that this is something that is very worthwhile and something that we would uh, 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 hope will continue on into the future. As I was telling the high school kids that we run uh, four, three or four programs every summer where the, uh, uh, we take for two weeks at a time uh, groups of high school students and two weeks at a time or three weeks at a time depending on on the uh, uh, what's, what's being done uh, college kids uh, and they sail with us uh, to learn how to sail the college kids actually get credit because we bring two professors with us on board uh, while we sail and they uh, are actually doing uh, environmental experiments and, and and monitoring and so on so that's the Niagara, that's the ship, and hopefully uh, the motto of the ship is don't give up the ship, and our real motto is don't give up on it. And don't give up on our ship, we want to keep it sailing uh, now and into the future. So, I'm happy to take any questions, uh, if uh, want to get the, someone want to get the lights for me, but uh, I'd be happy to take questions, yeah. In 1810, 1811, there could only have been a handful of ships on the lakes. The, the, the Great ship? Lakes, the biggest ships that were up there were small schooners, okay? And uh, they would be what we would call coasters. Their job was to, to follow the coastlines, and they were literally like the uh, tractor trailers of today. They hauled things from town to town uh, uh, in trade. Well, where did the shipwrights come from to build the Niagara? And the that other that is one of the most incredible stories of all. Uh, in uh, When the Congress ordered these ships built, they sent uh, uh, Oliver Hazard Perry to uh, get it organized and 
there was a man who was there already. His name was Daniel Dobbins. And he, was, he had started trying to get things organized ahead of time. But when, uh, he, when uh, Perry arrived and realized that things uh, were not going to proceed fast enough unless they got a really significant help, he uh, wrote to Congress, they, uh, to the Navy uh, Department, and they uh, brought 100 shipwrights from Philadelphia led by a famous shipbuilder at that time, whose name was Noah Brown. And Brown brought his uh, 100 shipwrights up to Erie. And this, every time I say it, I can't believe it's true, but it is. From the day they cut down the first tree until the ships floated, 90 days. Imagine, hand tools, no power tools. Every board hand sawed, every nail handmade, everything that whole ship put together by hand in 90 days. Could you do that today? No. The bureaucrats would be telling you, no, you gotta cut it in half and put it back together again. No, this this is an amazing feat, but that's how it got done. Such a great question. Yes. Sir. How did they have room for 155? <laughs> you know, every time I go go below deck, that crosses my mind. I get down there and I think, where did they put all these people? Well, let me tell you, uh, on the day that the battle took place, one-fourth of Perry's men in his nine ships were sick. Okay, and you can imagine illness just spread through that ship you know, as fast as you could, could possibly imagine. So, um, uh, they, you know, where, when it was possible, they, some of them probably slept on deck. We sleep on deck all the time. When we're in port, I sleep on deck virtually every night. Uh, we can't put, we can't sleep on deck when we're sailing because you're in, you're in the way of the people operating the ship. But at, at uh, in port, I sleep on deck. And they probably, a lot of them probably slept on deck also. Uh, but where they put them all, I haven't a clue. I really don't. Yes, sir? Since they had a short draft, do they have any kind of balance on it? Yeah, dude. I, shoot, I meant to look that up for today because I had the question uh, last week when I was making a presentation. And, and I'm getting old, and some of the statistics go out of my head. Uh, they, the amount of lead that they put in the bottom was, and still is, Phenomenal. There's a huge amount of lead. Uh, when Perry was building this, he, he told the Navy Department he needed lead for ballast. And they said, eh, I just put rocks in. He said, you don't understand. Our ship is like a barge. It's almost round on the bottom. Okay? And you need a huge amount of ballast to keep it upright. Uh, our, we don't have a, a keel that goes sharp and deep. All right? And so as a result, uh, he had to have a huge amount of lead. Well, when he explained that to them, they finally realized, yeah, he's right. And uh, because lead was in short supply, because what they made bullets out of, uh, they didn't want to send up all this lead, and they needed tons and tons of it. I want to say that there's, they were, that there's 50 tons of lead on board, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's correct. I, I've, got to, I've got to look that up again. And, and write that down in my own notes because for some reason it keeps slipping out of my head. But uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of that. Yeah. One question: um, You said they couldn't shoot the guns because of today because of Canada. Yeah. And what if you're in Lake Michigan? Oh well, it, you know we <laughs> we probably could uh, there. Uh, um, there. There's not a reason to. <laughs> you know we wouldn't want to endanger anybody else. Uh, any, anywhere else on the lake. Because uh, our cannons, even the carronades, will fire uh, about 900 yards. And uh, so you don't want to, you know, I mean, the chances of us hitting somebody, crap, we can't even aim the thing half the time. I mean, it would be, you know, none of us have ever fired a cannon in anger, so I have no clue how we would aim it. But uh, uh, yeah, we, we're not allowed. We don't even, we don't carry cannonballs on board. Except we, we have three, uh, cannibals that are models that are, that are tied onto a board just so people can see the difference between 
the three sizes of cannon. You have the cannonball, but no powder. Yeah, well, no, we we carried lots of powder. We fired we fired the gun all the time. Uh, that what kind of blanks do you use? Wood. We used two pounds of black powder. What kind of projectile? What? How do you? No, like we just put, put in. in a, it, it's put in. Uh, it's it's uh, put into a, a an aluminum foil pouch. It's rammed home, no wad, anything like that, because we don't want anything coming out of there uh, that could be of any danger. So there's no wadding or anything put in. Normally, you would have a, you would have a, a wad in there, and the in the cannonball. All you see is smoke. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of smoke and a lot of fire. <laughs> and it's it's pretty cool. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. And if you're on board, you get to fire the cannon too. <laughs> With, with this 150-some guys on board, how many cannonballs could they carry? Because you, you had 32-pound cannonballs. What did they do? Yeah, they, they, they were stacked. Uh, they, they had a special kind of uh, boards on deck that had holes that they could set them in okay, to keep them from rolling around. And then they also <laughs> stored more below deck. Um, and it, you see the difference today is we carry uh, uh, about 3,000 gallons of water and a couple thousand gallons of waste water. So that's a huge amount of weight. They didn't have to worry about that. They dipped the water. This is why Perry's crew was sick. And they were sitting in Putin Bay. They sat there for a week. And they were dumping the waste, of course, overboard at the head. And taking the water out from the stern. <laughs> yeah, who was right, okay. And they all had what Perry wrote was lake, lake fever. I was dysentery, okay. They were all getting diarrhea because they were drinking this horribly fetid water. They have brass monkeys? Yeah, brass monkey is a uh, urban legend, okay. Uh, look it up, it doesn't exist. No such thing on board a ship as a brass monkey. Nope. It's an urban legend. Like, that goes. I thought the pirates said that. No, 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 no. Doesn't exist. With such a shallow draft, was the boat pretty fast, and how fast would it go? Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I don't know how fast the original went. Uh, we've gotten up to. I've uh, been on board. We've done. And I know today this sounds like whoa. We, fourteen knots. Oh. When we hit fourteen knots, let me tell you. We're heeled over, you know, and you're going down the deck like this. It's, it's pretty Put exciting. Put trapeze on and hang out the side. Yeah, yeah. We, well, let me tell you, when you're like going up, the, cat, yeah. when you're going up the uh, ratlins to climb up the mast, you know, and the ship's heeled over. One of the things when when we climb and the ship's in motion, you have to understand the ship is not just going forward like this. It's also doing this. So when you go up above, the mast is actually doing this. And then when you go out on the yard, okay, the yards are up here, and the ship is doing this. So there's times when you're, you know, looking down and looking straight down at the water. Uh, it, it can get pretty exciting up there. <laughs> one ever flip of that vintage or that uh, era? Did one ever flip from heavy Oh, sure. To if, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's called being knocked down. Okay. If you get knocked down, uh, and that's usually uh, because you get caught when a squall comes up and you, and you haven't shortened sail or taken in sail, uh, if you get knocked down, depending on the, uh, the ballast, if the ballast is right, the ship will pull itself back up, okay? Uh, if you're familiar with the HMS Bounty that went down during Hurricane Sandy, uh, and I know people on board that ship and that, that survived it. In fact, one of the, their engineers uh, sailed with us uh, uh, right after that. Um, uh, the Bounty got got knocked down, okay? Uh, but she got knocked down by wave action more than, than by, uh, by wind. And, uh, uh, and how does that get up? Will that upright itself? Is that, that yeah, it, it, it will upright itself sometimes. Uh, sometimes they have, if you act quickly and you can cut away uh, uh, lines and sometimes they actually cut away a mast uh, and that'll allow it to uh, pop back up. But it's, uh, you know, Tricky. It can be pretty serious, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a real danger. We we are extremely careful how much sail we have up, uh, uh, you know, both safety reasons and you know the, the state of Pennsylvania has entrusted us with a four million dollar ship, uh, 
we, we just can't go out and you know be cowboys out there. So we're, we're pretty careful when we sail. Yes. Yeah. How, how many people we put out on a yard? When when we're uh, pulling in uh, the uh, four or the mainsail, uh, uh, it's it's huge. Uh, we'll usually put anywhere between twelve and fourteen people up on that yard. So we'll have you know seven on a side or six on a side, depending on what, what's going on. And also, <laughs> if we've got a whole lot of small people on board, we set up more, okay? <laughs> because the sails are heavy. Uh, when you're lifting the mainsail up, uh, the mainsail goes somewhere, I don't know, I think it's 800 uh, pounds or so. And you have to remember, when you're up there, you've got the yard here, and you're leaning over, and you're doing sort of a dead lift by, by lifting and pulling that sail up. And it is extremely difficult, uh, uh, even when you have a whole lot of people up there. Your footing, you're standing on what's called a foot rope. There's just a single rope uh, right there. Uh, <laughs> you can see they're all standing just on this foot rope. Okay. All right. Uh, so that's what you stand on. But, 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 but. Once you get out on the yard, we wear climbing harnesses and you clip in. So if you fall, you're only going to fall about two feet. All right. But when you're climbing up there, you're not clipped in. There's no way to clip in. So the ship is, you know, bouncing around. Uh, you got to hold on pretty tight. Uh, uh, but once you're up there, you know, you just clip in. And uh, truthfully, the only time. I get nervous climbing is in the dead of night. Um, that's pretty tough. Um, uh, we had a we had a storm coming across Lake Superior, and I was standing lookout. I was standing on lookout, and I heard them call uh, for all hands because they needed to get the sails in. And I'm thinking, oh no, we're in this horrible storm, and they're going to make me go aloft. And I turned around and looked at the mate, and I said, you want me to go? Too. And he said, no, no, you're on lookout. You just stay there. Like, yes. <laughs> you know, holding on to your life right there. But uh, um, it, it can get hairy at night because it's pitch black. We have no lights other than uh, our, our red and green running lights. And that's it. So. Do you have to be up there to lower the sails? No. You can't lower it from the ground. From uh, when, no, to take in the sail, uh, everything's done from deck. But you, to loose out the sails before you set them, you have to go aloft. And then once the sails are taken in from deck, you, you can't just let them hang there, okay? Because the wind will still catch them. So you have to go up now and stow them, okay? And we get furl, and furl the sails. So, and there, we have three different ways to furl them. And we have a storm furl, um, a... Um, um, <laughs> This getting old stuff is uh, getting old. Uh, harbor furl, uh, storm furl, and the other one. <laughs> the other one. I get my brain's like mush tonight. Anyway, so we, we have three ways to, to to stow them, but they have to be put away. Uh, you can't just leave them dangle. So they, they are put away. Yeah. What is the material the sails are made out? The modern sails are made out of a, a blended material that is uh, blended of, uh, uh, of a, of a um, synthetic uh, and cotton, okay? In the old days, they were made uh, out of linen, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they, they could be made out of uh, cotton also, but they were normally linen and um, something else they use. I can't remember. Yeah, the, but the canvas itself, the canvas is is, is just a general name. Uh, I can't come up. I, I think there was another material, and I, I can't come up with it. But uh, linen uh, was it. And they, the bigger ships carried different sails for different weather. 
they had fair weather sails and storm sails that they would switch out. We don't do that. It's it's huge amount of work to to uh, uh, not bend on a sail. It, it's just it's, it's an awful lot of work. So we don't do that. Yes. Um, the Great Lakes. It's two hundred years different. Are they have they lost depth? Or, I mean, to to my knowledge, the the lakes are pretty much as they were uh, uh, back in Perry's time. Uh, now, the one difference is, of course, is that we can now get to Lake Ontario because of the Welland Canal. So you can go from Erie, you, you know, the, the four Great Lakes on this side of, uh, of uh, Niagara Falls uh, are connected through the Welland Canal over to Lake Ontario. And I've done the Welland Canal uh, two times. Uh, it's a huge amount of work, but it's a, it's a heck of an experience to take the sailing ship through uh, uh, the, uh, the locks there. It's, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's about a, about a 10 hour uh, uh, passage through the uh, canal. Uh, the last time I went through another storm, <laughs> we were in the storm, but it took us, I was on deck for uh, about 22 hours straight. Uh, and then just when I thought I was done, they called for all hands again and you know, back on deck. So, uh, but uh, uh, the canal is a really interesting thing to see. How many locks are on the Welland Canal? The Welland has eight locks. Eight locks. Yeah, and then after you get to the other side of Ontario, there are three more locks uh, going up the uh, uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. I think there's three more locks. I'm not, I'm not sure, but if, if I, if I've gone through those because I've gone as far as Montreal. I know there's two for sure, but I think there's three. Yeah. So, so I'm confused. You said there's no power mechanically, and you're locking through. It. How do you go through lock, locks and dams like we have in yeah. the Corps of Engineers yeah. in Pittsburgh? How do you do that? Very carefully. That's when we use the engines. Okay. We don't sail any because. Um, so you do have power on board. It's yeah, we have two. We have oh, two I, diesel I engines. Okay. okay. We have two diesel engines. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, be, okay. Yeah, because we tie off on the sides just like we do in Pittsburgh. Exactly. Okay. Except that before we go in, our yards are wider than the ship. Okay. okay. So all of our yards are turned and put in what's called cockpit. Okay, like this, because if we went into the lock like this, and then the ship. Went down, we snap off our yards. Okay, so uh, everything has to be, so we have to take the ship sort of partly apart to go through the locks. Uh, Can anybody else walk through with you, or do you kind of control that? Uh, we, when when we were going up to Montreal, uh, we were going up for a tall ship festival, and there were three other tall ships that would that were kind of following us, and they all we all fit in together. Wow. Okay, but uh, we can't get in with a, a big ship. Uh, you know, if there's a laker or something going through, we, we can't go through. Uh, we have to wait for them to get through. So, yeah. Okay. Two hundred years ago, in Iran, did they have like a group that for mending masts? They had like a, a man. Yeah, shipwrights. You, you would have on board. You carried a carpenter uh, who's who was, should know how to make repairs. Uh, on things like that. They carried a sail maker on board uh, so that he could repair sails. Uh, and and uh, the ships, the bigger, this is on the bigger ships, something the size of the, the Niagara, they, it wouldn't have had a carpenter. Uh, there might have been one carpenter for three or four of the ships on board uh, uh, in the fleet, but there wouldn't have been a separate carpenter for each one. I, I think I heard one time where they said, they had a low draft because they could get into the bay. Oh, I, thank you. For, I, I, for, I, I never said it. Yes, that's exactly right. The reason for the shallow draft on the ship, the entrance to um, um, Prescott, there was a sandbar there. There was only seven feet of water. So when they were building the ship, they knew that the British couldn't attack us because they couldn't get over the sandbar. So there was a really safe place to build the ship. But we had to get the ships out of there. Okay, so they built them with shallow draft. Well, it's a 10-foot draft, so we still had three feet. So what they did was they built what were called camels. 
camels were great big boxes that were just empty boxes. And through the sweep ports, they ran large logs. And then they attached the camels on the outside. And they sunk them. Okay. Then, as they got to the, the uh, uh, sandbar, they pumped the water out. And they act like water wings. Okay, like little kids wear, you know, the swimmies. And, and it lifted the ship up to three feet. And they got over the bar and got the ships out. Okay. The British saw us doing it, but they were so far away, they didn't realize that the ships were totally downrigged and were totally empty. If the, the British had attacked at that moment, we'd have been done. But they were so far away with the optics that they had with their telescopes, they couldn't tell that we were totally downrigged. And uh, we were able to get out. In fact, they panicked and they sailed right back to Detroit uh, when they saw us coming out. Uh, but if they had attacked, it would have been all over. Okay. Anything else? Well, before you leave, if you're, you know, want to see some of the stuff uh, that I have up here, uh, you're welcome to stop up and take a look. Thank you again very much for uh, inviting me.